What started as a vision and a quest to meet the spiritual needs of Western New York's pioneers would evolve into an internationally acclaimed institution that 150 years later is regarded as a premier Franciscan university. It was Bishop John Tymon who, upon his appointment as Bishop of Buffalo in 1847, found a shortage of priests to serve the needs of a growing and geographically widespread diocese. Bishop Timon's need was teamed with the generosity and spiritual dedication of Nicholas and Mary Devereaux, who conceived the idea of bringing a Franciscan presence to Allegheny, New York, to help alleviate the lack of priests. The bishop's need and the Devereaux's commitment to the Catholic faith would join with the willingness and courage of the very reverend Father Pomfilo de Maliano, a young Franciscan priest from Abruzzi, Italy. Father Pomfilo was among four Italian Franciscan friars who traveled to Western New York in 1855 to complete this triangle of service. During his time in the United States, he would not only teach the first students at St. Bonaventure, but he would also found three communities of religious sisters, and he founded two churches including St. Pacificus in Humphrey, New York. On October 4, 1858, the first building on the campus was dedicated, and the following year the first students were enrolled. The years to come would be characterized by growth and transition. In 1874, a provisional charter establishing St. Bonaventure's College was granted by the Regents of the University of the State of New York, and the permanent charter was granted nine years later in 1883. Shortly thereafter, the college's eighth president, Father Joseph Butler, was appointed to what would be a highly regarded 24-year presidency. During this time, students enjoyed a well-rounded program of co-curricular activities, especially sports, as more time was devoted to baseball and football. By 1903, there was a full-blown rivalry in athletics between St. Bonaventure and Niagara University. The curriculum also expanded under Father Joe's watch, as did the physical plant. A new college building was constructed in 1901 and rebuilt as Lynch Hall, now De La Roche Hall, eight years later. Following Father Joe's death in 1911, the college began offering master's degrees in 1914, and programs in journalism and education were added to the curriculum as well as military science. In 1920, Father Thomas Plasman began a 29-year term of service that can only be labeled as courageous. During his presidency, the college experienced tremendous growth. Devereux Hall and Friedsome Memorial Library were built. The Franciscan Institute was created. The Bonaventure newspaper started, and the first women began to enroll in courses at night offered at St. Elizabeth's Convent and Academy. In 1930, St. Bonaventure suffered a devastating fire in the midst of the Great Depression that would be followed by a flood six months later, and yet another fire in 1933. Clearly, the college was on the brink of closure when Father Tom mustered the will to ensure that young men and women would continue to have access to the very special opportunities that only a St. Bonaventure education can provide. My boys won't ride the rails, he declared. Thomas Merton labeled Father Plasman as the picture of benevolence, as he led the college through times of war and depression. He is credited with positioning the institution to become a university, which happened in 1950 under the leadership of Father Juvenile Layler.
As the physical plant grew and academic and co-curricular programs flourished, St. Bonaventure's College and University attracted the attention of some well-known visitors. Thomas Merton spent time on the campus from 1938 to 1941, during which time he taught English for the college and found the inspiration for his life as a monk. In 1960, Robert F. Kennedy visited the campus in support of John F. Kennedy for president. Count Basie's band played for the junior prom in 1961, the same year that 2,500 people attended press day when Pierre Salinger, press secretary to President Kennedy, was the guest speaker. Walter Cronkite took his place as the press day speaker the following year. The decades of the 50s and 60s solidified the university's position as a premier Franciscan university. During this time, Robinson, Falconio, and Shea Laughlin residence halls were constructed, as was Christ the King Seminary, now Francis Hall. Plasman Hall opened in 1959, Hopkins Hall in 1964, and the new friary was built, now Doyle Hall. Friedza Memorial Library was expanded and the University Center was constructed. It was rededicated as the Riley Center in 1974, in memory of Mike Riley, who served as coach and athletic director from 1928 to 1943. This was also a time when St. Bonaventure basketball began to earn the school a national reputation as players such as the Stith brothers led by coach Eddie Donovan took the first trip to the NCAA tournament in 1961. In the previous four seasons, the Brown Indians made the National Invitation Tournament at Madison Square Garden in New York City. Father Reginald Redlin assumed the presidency in 1967. He created the Faculty Senate and increased the number of faculty members with terminal degrees. Father Reginald also added laymen to the Board of Trustees, which up until this time had all been members of the Franciscan Order. The 1970s were ushered in by a legendary season of basketball when Bob Lanier, Billy Kalba, and Matt Gant led the team to the NCAA Final Four. Father Matthias Doyle served as president from 1975 to 1990 and assured the continuing development of campus facilities and the academic curriculum. The computer science program was added in 1980, and Meekum Hall, now the John J. Murphy Professional Building, was dedicated in 1981. Also during Father Doyle's service, the HEOP program was established at St. Bonaventure, and the garden apartments in a new friary were constructed. The university's first capital campaign was initiated in 1988. As longtime librarian Father Irenaeus Herscher neared the end of his life, the Franciscan mountain retreat that would bear his name was envisioned. With the inspiration and hard work of Father Dan Riley, along with many other volunteers and benefactors, Mount Irenaeus was incorporated in 1984. Father Neil O'Connell served as president for three years from 1990 to 1993 during difficult economic times for the university. Nevertheless, this was the time when graduate programs began at Hilbert College, construction on the Quick Center started, and the Mass Communication School was renamed the Russell J. Jandoli School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Sister Alice Gallen earned a permanent place in SBU Hearts during her year as interim president, and Dr. Robert Wickenheiser's tenure was marked by difficult decisions taken to ensure economic recovery and by commitment to Catholic education at all levels. He guided the building of the Richter Center, nurtured the first programs at the Quick Center, and appointed the commission for the future that created the university's blueprint for progress. Following inspired transitional leadership from Father Dominic Monti, the university welcomed Sister Margaret Carney as its 20th president in 2003. Sister Margaret's leadership is characterized as stabilizing and energizing, as the university is again experiencing a growth pattern that serves to position St. Bonaventure for another 150 years of excellence in the Franciscan tradition. St. Bonaventure University has endured and thrived all these fabulous years because of the commitment and vision of friars and other religious, lay faculty and administrators, presidents, students, alumni, and many generations of benefactors. Each of these individuals has made a difference in the life of the university and the students it serves. As we celebrate the sesquicentennial, we are asking those who are central to the current life and future of St. Bonaventure University to consider their legacy. Taking an ancient tradition, an ancient wisdom tradition, the Franciscan theological, intellectual tradition, and translating that tradition into the incredible imperatives of life in the 21st century. Whether those imperatives have to do with war and peace, the environment, the care of children, um, the way in which elders 
are incorporated and loved and, and nurtured in our society. The ethics of the business world, uh, the ministerial needs of churches and faith groups, all of those areas have something to gain from the beautiful tradition that comes down to us from Francis and Bonaventure and Claire and Scotus and so many other great thinkers and, and mentors in our tradition. I hope that I have added to the passion quotient at St. Bonaventure. I hope that someday one of the students who graduates from my program will look back and recognize that passion and then will be inspired to amp up her own passion and inspire a new generation. I think that St. Bonaventure offers us as um, employees an opportunity to really play a role in the future of this university. Um, I hope that they will remember the School of Business as a place where we really worked hard to develop relationships with um, the business community so that our students would be able to develop into very well respected, technically competent individuals who could compete in a dynamic and changing business environment. For me as a friar, my defining story is the story of Francis meeting the Sultan during the Fifth Crusade. This, is, this has been for me for years now the model um, of what it means to be a friar. Someone who can cross the bridges, cross the cultural differences. So I hope that my legacy to my students is having opened their hearts and their minds to a love and an appreciation of Middle Eastern culture. And I hope students will say he did that for us the way Francis attempted to do it for the friars. I think I will leave less mark on this institution by far than the mark this institution has left on me. I have been won over by the spirit on this campus, which we talk about, but which I think is a reality, that this is a place where people are kind and decent to other people and instilling a, uh, a desire to be of service to others. Um, I see that in my colleagues in the biology department as well as other departments and schools, the, the commitment that they have to their students, to helping them to learn, and then also helping them to grow as people. Um, I think I had something of that in me in that I wanted to teach and I wanted to, to work specifically at a school like this, um, but it's something that has definitely won me over during the time that I've been here. So if I would like to accomplish anything long term, it would be to be one more advocate for that way of living and that mindset. What will be your legacy?